And with that, so I'm going to open it for the question that all of you may have for the whole panel. Thank well, you very much. Thank you, Elena. That was excellent. Um, I think that we have, uh, in a transdisciplinary way, taken you through a journey that began with uh, the brain economy at a macro level uh, to neuroplasticity and uh, resilience, as well as research examples from uh, Kate's work and Pat's work. And then we're closing out the, the panel discussion with, well, how do you take these concepts into product development, such as uh, the work that we're doing in Achilles? Uh, so thank you, everyone, for an excellent uh, panel uh, conversation. We have received quite a few questions, um, and I am going to try to summarize some of them. Uh, uh, Harris, I think you got quite a few questions. Um, I, people want to understand this concept of brain capital. And in particular, what is the inherent purpose of brain capital? And then what are the potential downsides? I mean, is there a risk that uh, we, we sort of further uh, expand uh, inequities in society when this becomes a currency of, uh, of uh, measurement? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Harris? Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Dapo, and, and thanks everyone for those questions. Uh, I think at a human level, at a humanistic level, brain capital is closely related to flourishing. If you have high brain capital, high brain health, high brain skills, you have flourishing, which is the state of uh, you know, contentment and enjoyment in life and doing well with friends, family and, and such. There's a whole literature on flourishing and, and we work with Andrew Nevin on this from the Harvard Flourishing Center uh, to make sure that we're interarticulating brain capital with flourishing. But on an economic level, brain capital it's really like central to the whole way that the economy functions. Without Without uh, brains, we don't have any capital. Without brains, we don't have any economy, right? We don't have any productivity or thinking or ability to do stuff, build stuff. Uh, and then conversely, without capital, we don't have brains. If we don't invest in education, we don't invest in education and healthcare. You know, we don't have brain power to do creative things and build things and whatever. So that's my answer to what it means on a humanistic and on an economic level. Um, yes, I think it does have the potential to create discrimination, uh, for sure, if we don't do this very carefully. You, you could potentially discriminate people based on their brain capital, discriminate, you know, in, in many different ways, right, educationally and workforce-wise. So that cannot happen. And we work very closely at the OECD with Karen Rommelfanger, who's a neuroethicist, just exactly on this issue. And, and I think, like, one of the things that Sandy Chapman perhaps would say from the Center for Brain Health is that we want people to be compared to themselves with their own brain capital. We don't want them to be compared and have any of their data ever shared with anyone on an individual level. Um, but, but then conversely, uh, if you think about it, and this is my last point, then I'll stop. Um, if we don't think about brain capital at all, the brain capital gap will widen. We have people that are the haves with brain capital, people like us on this call and at this seminar, and people that are have-nots, that don't have had the fortune of education and have had perhaps early childhood challenges and, and poverty and such. So we have this sort of, uh, for purposes of the discussion, we have this sort of gap already. And you can imagine as the world goes forward, as the economy gets more knowledge intense, as, as you need education and skills to keep up with modern jobs that are cognitively taxing and, and whatnot, People that don't have brain capital to start with or have lower brain capital rather, to put it more appropriately, they risk their job loss. If they lose their job, they get into a cycle of depressive sort of melancholia, despair, challenge. You know, they, then they just don't have economic means, financial means to, and, and, and energy and motivation to go and get upskilled or reskilled. So they can potentially spiral downwards. Whereas uh, people like us here on this call that are fortunate we are living well, right? And we're just, we're talking about all this like sophisticated stuff today, right? So we're just getting kind of higher and higher in brain capital. So, so there, there is a, the wedge of brain capital gap is just going to get worse if we don't take sustained effort, research, policy, and investing. Um, and then anyway, so that, th those are my points in response to that. I hope that's uh, useful and coherent. Yes, uh, thank you, Harris. Um, Sandeep, question for you. Um, uh, neuroresilience is multifactorial. 
uh, how do you integrate social cultural lifestyle factors into this concept of uh, neuroresilience? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, even with TMS, which I do clinically every day, uh, it's not it's not a cure, right? It's not going to cure depression. It's not going to cure a disorder, but it does allow you to use neural uh, plasticity to to kind of change brain states. And I tell my patients this all the time: is the goal is to change brain states so you're not in that say deep hole of depression for depression patients. But then lifestyle is really important. So I really focus on lifestyle uh, actually in terms of stress management, like meditation and yoga, exercise, nutrition. And those are the things that people really should do once they start feeling better with something like TMS. So it's really a combination. I mean, I totally agree. It's not going to be one thing that's going to help everyone. Um, in my own research, I actually have sort of three things that I look at. TMS is one of them. The other is actually meditation and yoga. And the third is uh, brain training, digital therapeutics. So I didn't mention the, the yoga and meditation aspect, but I think that's actually really critical. And I think that, um, so we've done studies where we've looked at uh, TM, Transcendental Meditation, and how that can improve resilience. We actually had a study where we looked at healthcare workers, actually, during the pandemic. And if we can improve their resilience uh, and decrease anxiety, decrease depression, and actually show changes in the brain uh, with TM. And so we're, we've just presented this data. And we did show that, actually, TM does actually cause all of these good changes in the brain. I've also uh, similarly done some studies with Sky, Sudarshan Kriya Yoga, SKY, which is a rhythmic breathing yoga practice, which can also help in terms of brain resilience. So I think it's all of the above. It's not going to be one particular thing. Well, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, Pat, a uh, question for you. Uh, actually, a couple of questions. One around uh, language and culture and how do you integrate those into these tools? And then uh, someone wondered about uh, your studies, what the dropout rates were in, in, in the older age group. Okay. Um, I'll take the, the first, the second one first. That's really easy. The, um, you know, the, the studies where we were um, working with people one-on-one, -on -one, right, the locally recruited studies, our dropout is really, really low. But that, um, it's like, two, you know, 2% and oftentimes had more to do with the assessment technology than the therapy um, because we were doing fMRI and some people when they did the first one didn't want to do a second one right um, and so uh, it or it was because of illness or some life, circumstance, you know, which is not unusual for a geriatric population. I will say that when you do research with older adults, they're very hard to recruit, but once you do, they stick with you. It's very, um, they're very, um, uh, adherent group of people want, you know, once they make a commitment, they're going to see it through no matter what. And that just seems to go with the cohort. Um, you know, as we, as we all age, we seem to be a little bit more compliant. Um, in terms of language and culture, I love that question because it's really what I'm all about. And um, I will say that uh, Achille and I don't know if Dapo and Elena were around at the time actually translated um, Endeavor into Spanish for us. Partly it was a very easy lift for them because there's very little language during the game, right? It's mostly woohoo and wow and you know all of that. The real translation was just um, you know the the setup, and um, I believe it was Joaquin and Gary who did the translation, who speaks Spanish. And so he could just do the over voiceover for the character when they were explaining how to use the game in the game. Um, but uh, so that part of it, the setup's a little easier to translate. Uh, so I, I actually feel like when it's a game like that, where there's very little dialogue, there's not a narrative in there, it's not that difficult to, to kind of put it out into the community of people who speak other languages. The issue of culture, though, is a totally different one. Um, I do believe that it, before you introduce a product to, um, you know, uh, you know, other cultures, you should do some user testing just to make sure you're not being offensive in some way, um, or that um, there isn't something about the the way that the game is illustrated that that is doesn't make any sense to 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 the culture. So before you do anything, yes, you absolutely should do a gut check with the community. But really the bigger pro, um, question or problem is um, in some of the question, the countries that were mentioned in this question, such as India and South Africa, is, um, you know, it is the uh, issue of access to technology um, that you, as Harris was pointing out, there are 
um, communities where uh, it's not that easy. You can't just hand them an iPad and say, go for it. Uh, there are things like the, the cost of data, um, you know, the inaccessibility to stable Wi-Fi that is always going to be a challenge. And so um, I agree with Harris, we need to be much more mindful about what tech companies can do to support these communities that don't have access. We have these communities here in the United States too, uh, instead of blasting themselves into outer space, which is my opinion. Well, thanks, Pat. I will add that, uh, so at Achille, we are collaborating with uh, Shinogi in Japan and, uh, you know, our, uh, our game has been uh, translated into Japanese with, with uh, a number of cultural uh, considerations and it's been studied as we speak right uh, now. Uh, a question for probably the entire panel. Uh, it's been a, it's a common problem that transition from lab to market, uh, that persistent and dropout, persistence and dropout rates are different than in academic medical centers. Uh, compared to community. What are your thoughts on that? Any Anybody interested in taking that on? The, the difference between controlled environments and the real world, I think that's what the question's getting at. I, I can start, maybe the rest of the team can also give a little bit more detail in their experience. So basically, I think this is a very relevant question is important to understand right where it comes from because when we design a clinical study that we collaborate with different research center or hospital so they make sure right that the participants you know they actually comply you know at least you know they they give them phone calls or they actually call them to come back for the the, the final assessment and this is something that in real life, we know that this is not the case, right? We know that once you send one of those digital therapeutic out, it's gonna be either you have a system in which you control, you know, whether the, the participant, they're engaged and if they have any issues, so you give kind of like a, a consumer service, you know, kind of like a, an assistance, you know, if they have any questions or actually you're relying on education, right? Education from the healthcare provider, education with the caregivers, right? To allow them to understand what is the relevance of commitment, you know, and align, you know, what is the treatment plan that your kids or your or yourself, right, you are going through when you agree to follow this specific treatment, right? Because it's not just take a pill, right? This is a commitment on doing a therapy for a longer period of time. And I think this is very important. It's all talking about education and creating a better understanding. And with that, I, I will send it to uh, Pat, who was the first one raising her hand. <laughs> I'll just, yeah, I'll just be really brief. I think that when it comes to technology-based care, something we know very well in the literature is that if it's unguided, um, you're going to have variable adherence to, to, the, um, to the intervention. Uh, I think we still have an opportunity to study what does that mean? You know, for a therapeutic video game, it's pretty clear that, you know, there is a dose. And, um, and so we, you know, for that, I think, you know, we need to work, think about like whether or not this is something that could actually be self-guided um, given the poor adherence or the less optimal adherence that, that someone has. Um, so I do think, I agree with Elena, that this is something that has to be integrated into the healthcare system um, as part of an overarching, you know, this is how we treat cognition, uh, and that the coach, whether it's in person or online, is somebody there that can help support and motivate people to stay with the, um, with the program. Yeah, Kate, you go, and then Harris after that. Yeah, I was just going to mention that, you know, I think children are kind of uniquely positioned to um, access this uh, type of treatment, like a, a digital technology, because they're in school. So it's going to be community-based partnerships. And by disseminating through the schools that it, most kids go to school. Um, and so it may be a matter of working with teachers and educators who are also very interested in brain health and, you know, having the kids do better in school if, you know, as a, as a result of such training. And then the other piece, I think, with um, children, certainly with regard to compliance, because I appreciate uh, Pat's point about dosing, is parents. Um, and that, again, is something that uh, parents could be touched through the school. How do you get your kid to, to, to play this game that, that's going to help their brain? I think the game is actually pretty fun, and, and Elena might be able to speak more to that. Um, some of the kids want to play it because they enjoy it. But if you're up against, um, you know, family situations or, you know, individual children that don't want it, you know, how can you partner with the parent? Harris. Thank you. Absolutely. 
Um, so in my, in my day job with Proteo, which is really a executive services group where we specifically help complex brain health technologies get into the marketplace, get into healthcare, get into the community. We work with health systems, researchers, companies to, to really make that fit between like a, re, a highly reductionistic trial and the real world. We, we have this model that that we've developed uh, called a demonstration project, which is a quasi clinical trial, quasi naturalistic study, quasi implementation in a health system. And what that requires is that scientists and clinicians that have done the reductionistic work, they need to brace themselves for getting into some kind of fused project with a health system. We just take that. And then the health system needs to be prepared that you know, research doesn't think in reductionistic terms. Uh, sorry, research does think in reductionistic terms. Research doesn't generally think about naturalism. So we need sort of like, just to put it very simply, we need this sort of demonstration project thing so that we get researchers and technologists working respectfully and empathetically with health system executives. And, and sort of we need to co-design these things so that we sort of get a smoother transition from reductionistic trials into the actual real world. Um, so that's that's what I offer on this. And you? Yeah, I just wanted to add that from a TMS perspective, uh, sort of the translation from clinical trials, academic centers to real world, it's actually worked out really well. So adherence is actually really high with TMS. Now, it is an in-clinic treatment, so we know if the you know, person's not showing up, so that could have something to do with it. But there's about a 98% adherence, actually, to TMS in, in real-world clinical studies. And that's what I've seen in my clinic as well. Um, but again, it could be particular to TMS being in person, and it's five days a week. It's for six weeks. But, I mean, you can imagine. I mean, it's pretty intensive. And so it is kind of surprising that people are willing to do that. Uh, and to make that effort, but that's what we've seen in in real in the real world. In my, in meditation at the TM study that we did, we that was in healthcare workers. We actually saw very high real world adherence as well. You know, ninety five percent or higher adherence. Again, that's maybe a special population because that's healthcare workers, and they're already really motivated to improve their resilience in the face of the COVID pandemic. So, but I think, yeah, overall adherence can be a problem with, with any of these things. I mean, initially there's some excitement, of course, and people start doing it, but, but certainly uh, I can imagine as time goes on, they're not gonna continue to do it. So like, for example, with meditation um, and with, um, with sky practice, yoga practice, I mean, they may do it initially for three months or whatever it may be, but maybe not ongoing. Uh, with TMS, the advantage is that it's a very concrete amount of time. It's six weeks for the acute part of the treatment and you're done. So at least people know that. But if it were ongoing, then I'm sure adherence would be a bigger problem. Yeah, if I might add to that, I, I think that there is no doubt that there are translational gaps between where these technologies are and where the health, health system is. And uh, we have to think about innovative ways to expand the capacity of the healthcare system, uh, look at workforce issues, such as Harris was talking about, cognition counselors. And so we have to really take a systems view of how do you kind of translate these technologies into the, into the practice environment. Uh, Harris? Just, just one more quick thing, Dapo, that you and I have talked about. In, investors, venture capital investors that are funding early stage companies need to understand this issue. They need to understand that if they pull something out of uh, academia that's had a bunch of really nice trials done that have very tight inclusion exclusion criteria the VC has to know that they need to be on the hook to fund a little bit of further work in the health system in the real world and, and they can't just say no we're not funding that like just 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 force this technology into the market well sorry you guys have to kind of stand up and commit to this and and work with us not just sort of wash your hands of it so well thank you Harris um so there's a question here that I think I might take on. It has to do with, uh, you know, uh, should other tools also go through FDA approval, uh, such as the case with the first game-based digital therapy in ADHD? Yeah, you know, I think that that relates up to individual companies. But what I will say is that uh, we at Achilles only believe that uh, the science has to be rigorous and, and it has to be pressure tested, whether it, that's in peer review or through the regulatory process. And, and that, uh, you know, if we to do rigorous science, we all benefit from that. that that's really um, uh, what I would say to that uh, to that question. Uh, we're running out of time, so if we don't get to all your questions, um, I think that we'll continue in the Slack channel. 
Um, Kate, someone asked, uh, what do you consider to be valid anxiety? Yeah, I, I saw that. Um, so really valid anxiety, if you want to, is, is, I think what they mean is normative anxiety versus, you know, problematic anxiety. So problematic anxiety is anxiety that gets in the way. So you can imagine a situation where a little bit of anxiety is a good thing. Like a little bit of anxiety motivates you to study for a test, to meet your grant deadline, whatever it is where anxiety starts getting in the way is it's so distracting that you can't study or it's so overwhelming that you don't even write the grant. Um, and, and those are kind of small examples, but it's having anxiety that gets in the way every day across multiple domains is distressful and disabling. That is anxiety that we wanna treat. I think maybe by valid anxiety, <clears throat> it was meant in this question, sort of normative anxiety. Of course, there's normative anxiety. Like if somebody is, um, you know, terminally ill, they're going to be very anxious about that. You know, yeah, you can you can try to treat that, but it's much more of a different kind of supportive approach than that notion of overcoming anxiety that's excessive and too much and not realistic. Well, thank you, Kate. And uh, with that, I want to thank the panelists for a kind of wide ranging and uh, exciting conversation, um, as well, all the participants. Uh, sorry if we didn't get to your question. We'll try to continue in the Slack channel. And to the organizers, uh, very much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.